Hi, welcome to the TheaterCast, presented by the EdReach Network, giving educators a voice, a big voice. You've reached episode number 39, being recorded Friday, December 13th, 2013. This is a show where theater teachers and professionals share their passion for theater trends, share practical advice and tips, and ask questions of some of, most, some of theater's most innovative collaborators. I'm your host, Nick Cusimano, and joining me, as always, is my co-host, Danielle Phylas. Good evening. And then we have two special guests joining us tonight. I'm going to let Danielle uh, introduce one of our guests, and I'll introduce the other. I coming to you live from where the magic happens in the <laughs> sewing room is my wonderful friend, often theatrical savior, not only in costuming but in mental uh, capacities as well, Carolyn Spiker. Yay! Say hi to the nice people, Carolyn. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hello. And then joining me is uh, my wife, Beatrice. <laughs> Kusumano or B. Kusumano. And um, just to give you a little background information, um, you know, being a theater teacher, you have to rent costumes. And uh, lo and behold, that's how I met my wife, was <laughs> renting costumes from the local university. <laughs> I think we initially met when I did King and I. Yes. And then a year later. Yeah. Butler came to dinner. Butler did it. Uh, what? The man who came to dinner. Yeah, I think man that was, came to that dinner. That was it. <laughs> Somewhere right around there. You guys um, didn't need to tell us you were married. That little five-second <laughs> talk right there. Everybody, <laughs> you were legit married. <laughs> and so um, we met that way, and. Uh, so, um, since and it's true. When you find a good costumer, you just go <laughs> on like <laughs> in death. I told, yeah. I told him the best tip for doing costumes on a budget is marry a costumer. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put a link to that in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's a website. <laughs> and I've got to say that Carolyn family, Carolyn's husband is a fantastic director and a fight choreographer. So, palling up with those two, you, you got your whole Done. show. We got it rolling. all covered. There you <laughs> go. But he gets a lot of cheap costuming out of it, too. So, <laughs> same kind of relationship. Of, oh, hey, honey, this needs fixing tonight. Oh, well, hold on. I, don't, I do costuming for shows I have nothing to do with just because he brings home everybody else's stuff that tore during the run. Or during yeah. that night, and is like, can you fix this tonight? Yes, I can fix Probably it Probably tore during his fight choreography. Yeah, but other people's <laughs> pants, too. Everybody yeah. else's <laughs> stuff. Or, or Nick saying things like, how would you cut out a pair of pants if you were building one? You'd just, like, cut one leg and the other, right? Uh, oh, yeah. No, there needs to be a crotch, honey. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll be making you pants tomorrow. <laughs> just tubes, really. That's it. Yeah, yeah, that's what he told me, and I was like, huh. I, I better just do this for you. <laughs> yeah. No, I ended up doing this. Yeah, but, you, but I drew you yes. a picture of what the pattern was supposed to look like. <laughs> True that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't do anything. It takes me three hours and a lot of therapy to thread a needle. So <laughs> you, costumers, you costumers are my heroes. So. I'm really excited. I think this is going to be a great um, help to yeah. people. And we'll talk yeah. tonight about... Costuming on a budget, especially because um, I think all of the theater companies I know of <laughs> um, are interested in that, and every certainly every school theater program. Yeah, I think that um, one of the the things <laughs> that I noticed um, when I was working at the university is that we'd have a lot of high schools that would come in and say we need help and where do we start and one of the biggest things that I would tell my students who were going through the program and I would tell high school teachers is details you can get away with a really pretty off period piece if you remember that in the 1950s women are wearing gloves when they go out <laughs> men wear a hat if you remember that white kids do not go with everything <laughs> that proper shoes are a must <laughs> 
And again, you can fake those things, but you need those details to really convince your audience that you're in a time period. Mm -hmm. and, and that was one of the, the bigger, cheapest ways to make some of those long ago and far away costumes <laughs> into the correct period. Yeah, yeah, I get in trouble for long ago and far away. Yeah, he does. <laughs> well, it's true. It's, um, <laughs> one of the conundrums I think directors face and um, directors at, at schools especially face is that you uh, doing Shakespeare and other period pieces, but especially Shakespeare since it's well known, it draws a crowd and is in English, sort mm -hmm. of, as we said in the last show. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, but and there's no royalties, and so it's a really attractive choice to do. And I think people often forget that it's that it's generally set in a period. And if it's not, if you decide to recontextualize it. You still have to costume it. <laughs> Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. Naked Shakespeare in a high school is not a good thing to do. Yeah. No. yeah. <laughs> I always have kind of uh, gone with the silhouette too. Like she was saying with details, if if the silhouette looks right, you know, if they're not wearing um, a Victorian style corset type of thing or that kind of blousing or something like that when it's supposed to be more Elizabethan and that they have the longer skirts and you know th that sort of stuff that they wouldn't have a knee length skirt at that time it's you know if you, you can get away with a lot like she said details having the right a few key pieces if you have the right silhouette with it as well yeah, I agree 100 percent yeah so how could you fake a corset <laughs> oh gosh um I mean, I, I, that's, I think, one of those things that isn't, at least for, for a lot of things, you don't have to have the corset for everything. And I think that becomes kind of a crutch for some of the stuff. Um, you know, a sh I think people have this impression that in certain time periods, everybody wore a corset from, you know, the milkmaid up when they really yeah. didn't. You know, they had a... a probably much more loose-fitting garments than what you see at, like, your local Ren Fair when everybody's, you know, spilling out and such. That it is really just a vest that they were wearing on top of things. It does not have to be lifting and supporting the girls. They're just, it's just a vest that's tied in the center. And it can, you know, normally the, the chemise was probably up about here, you know, looking at paintings of the time is always a really helpful thing. And they're not spilling over in every painting. You know, they're just wearing probably, you know, something that they got from their mom. So it probably doesn't fit completely perfectly and cinched in everywhere and so on when you're talking about, like, your peasant class and such. So it doesn't have to be that form-fitting, tight thing like a corset for a lot of the characters. But if you do need a corset on a budget, a long line bra goes a long way to giving you that tucking in the stuff that we just need to tuck in. So a long long line bra. So Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That with a vest and you're ready to go. <laughs> Another thing to get away from with the 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 cheap fix for shoes for an Elizabethan would be um the swim shoes, they have a name. What are they called? Water socks. Mm. If you get, get those, they kind of, they're cheaper than ballet slippers, and high schools on a budget can maybe get away more with that than buying a pair of ballet shoes, or obviously they're not attempting to make a shoe. Um, but that's another cheap fix right there. Well, and so many of those ballet flats are at Old Navy for two bucks anymore, too. Excellent. So, you know, that's, I think, part of it is you got to look at, like, it's just a ballet flat, and you can go to Kohl's or Old Navy or whatever and get them in black and brown for, yeah. you know, five bucks if you get it there on the right day, or Kohl's with all their gift cards and such and the fun thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, you know? it's not hard to uh, to get things at Kohl's very cheap. That's no, true. No, not at all. True, true, true. I think that's one of the big things for, um, certainly for theater on a, on a budget high school theater type stuff, is looking around at what you can use that's out there. Um, mm -hmm. A few years ago, those granny boots were in, then they were out for a while. I think they're back in now. 
you can start finding them at secondhand stores and picking up those. They work for a lot of your basic peasant periods. Um, and again, we want to be specific in our period, but sometimes that specificity comes with a price that we can't quite afford. So the long ago and far away, as long as you got those details, and uh, we're okay then. Right now, also, riding boots are great for men for period pieces. Again, they're expensive, but we've got all of these <laughs> boots that are in right now that have the riding boot look. So, Which means you can probably start to find them soon in thrift stores yes. and once they go out. <laughs> and sometimes... Um, what I there's a website I use called theaterhouse.com and they take purchase orders which works great because I'm in a school um, and always trying to find those places uh, that you can um, order from. They have a lot of um, they have a lot of hats, a lot of hats, and uh, they have a range of prices on their hats. Some are um, some are a little more pricey, but they're a little higher quality. So, and is it it's, what's that? I'm sorry, Nick. Oh, I was just going to say, um, they have a lot of uh, stuff that will look fine for stage mm -hmm. that you're not going to pay a ton of money for. I mean, like, if you need, if you can't solve the riding boot thing, you can buy riding boot spats there for under 20 bucks for a pair, um, and maybe even less. Cause, uh, well, for like, that size, pair. For that size 13 to 15 boy. You know, that really huge foot that you're not going to find a girl's riding boot out there. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, then that, and if you have them with the dress shoes, that'll probably look fine for stage, um, which works great. Um, and they have a lot of, um, if you really have the, those students who want to take it further, they have a lot of uh, hat patterns, millinery stuff, if I'm... Using the word correct. Millinery correct. correct. Yeah. Which is one of her favorite things. It is. Um, <laughs> the accessories are my favorites. <laughs> that you can then use those to create uh, hats from all different time periods and then put your own material around them. And so I find. So they have the blanks, is what you're saying. Yes. Like for, for somebody who's not familiar with the terms we're talking about, if a bride goes to a fabric store and wants a, a hat or something for her veil, she'd buy that white canvasy looking thing mm -hmm. and that's what you would recover then. So, Another tip that I would give to high school te uh, teachers, and I'm really speaking primarily to high school, um, is befriend your local universities and community theaters <laughs> because they are a huge resource and can help you out with a lot of uh, a lot of more specialty things that you can't find. I mean, uh, we don't have uh, medieval clothes are us, and so if you want to, you know, befriend those those places that keep them in stock. I mean, it so. seems like most universities and colleges um, and community theaters are pretty friendly about about that. They might make you sign something, <laughs> yes, uh, uh, to to say that you break it, you bought it, um, or and specifying how they want the costumes to be treated, but um, it seems like, a, to, I, in my experience, they've all been really friendly and giving about uh, helping uh, to, lend, to lend things out. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I think that, um, that for universities, it tends to be a, a good, good way to recruit, <laughs> and, uh, and it's also, it just, you know, it makes goodwill for the community in general. So, yeah, I can think of a couple of dresses. Both Carolyn and I are in the Columbus, Ohio area. I can think of a couple of dresses. I think that I have seen in nearly every Shakespearean play in, <laughs> <laughs> in the area. <laughs> I think it's when they do Regency a lot. Yeah, that the, the Regency period, you see the same dress repeated. Just <laughs> travels all over. Uh huh. It's the most cast um, <laughs> Columbus um, I always love those. There's a couple websites out there that track dresses, uh, like on BBC. 
Oh. <laughs> and it'll like show you when you've seen it on Doctor Who and when you've seen it on like the the, the tutors and stuff like that. And you're like, That's I have great. seen that dress before. <laughs> it's, 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 it's funny to see because you are like, uh huh. Then that's the same vest from that movie to that movie. So. They need to have an E inside Hollywood um, expose <laughs> on the dress. On the costumes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrific. I had no idea I'm going to look mm -hmm. for that. that is I don't know where I ran across it, but I just thought it was hilarious one day. Going through <laughs> and watching the same waistcoat on seven different guys. Well, I love these <laughs> specifics you guys have given about um, the, uh, the bra or the... Um, corset and the spats for shoes and the ballet flats and um, what are some other must-have um, pieces that maybe people could might even have really easy access to and not know that would be good for um, a Shakespearean sort of wardrobe and another would be another I think it's done a lot is Greek Greek theater mm. gets done quite a bit as well um, and I know, Carolyn, you did some clever, clever, clever things when you costumed for Helen of Sparta for me, which was sort of great. I gave you the direction sort of, of Greekish because it's Greek not. Greekish. <laughs> well, and, you know, the, the thing that I, I guess would be my kind of style, if you will, is having that kind of allusion to something. Um, you know, what can you take? Like, for example, when the, the show she's talking about, one of my favorite things I did was I, I found this um, Cuban shirt, you know, with the, the pleating and the decoration and pockets and such. But I really loved the pleating, and I thought it was this good color, and there was a retired, like, army guy in the, move, in the show. And, but I didn't like the sleeves and everything, so I took the sleeves off and took the pockets off, but you still had all that, you know, the, the, the embroidery and mm -hmm. everything. And it kind of gave the look of like a richer style vest and it had the tab collar, you know. So taking the collar and the sleeves and such off of just a regular shirt kind of gave that illusion to the, the period we were doing. It was so great. It looked that was so one of my terrific. Favorite. And yeah. so I, I think having, you know, kind of it there, but enough that you can look at that person and go, oh, that person is this, or that it's Greek because... There's this silhouette to it, but it might not right. be the right colors, etc. But it has that kind of flow. And a lot of the stuff that I found for that show was thrift store like draperies. I just ran across this, you know, like these, I don't even know what they were, but it was basically drapery and sheets and so on. And you just, you know, do the, turn it halfway, cut it, and then tab it, you know, shoulder, mm -hmm. arm here and arm there and belt it and, Ta-da, it's Greek. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right, and they were gorgeous, too. They were absolutely gorgeous. And you had all the women happen to have, you just asked all the actors, female actors in the show, do you guys have those kind of strappy sandals? And everybody came in with the perfect sand, and like you could never have gone out and bought what they, they happened to have in their own wardrobe. Yeah. Well, and like she said, that was what, at the time was those those Grecian kind of gladiator sandals were yeah. very in. And now, yeah, if you need to do some sort of army thing or something where they're like swashbuckly, the knee high boots and above are everywhere. And you can yeah. you couldn't find those for about you know, you could find them in like early nineties. And, and then, then, it, then they took a break. While. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> good luck right. trying to get a knee-high pair of boots at Payless for however long. Well, mm -hmm. I guess we all need to thank Johnny Depp for that one. <laughs> yes. Well, I want to thank Johnny and... Depp in general. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Johnny. <laughs> I want to you piggyback on, <laughs> on to what you're saying about the illusion. Um, one thing that I did want to mention is that as customers, we're not trying to reproduce in historic accuracy every single bit of a costume. Uh, some of those costumes you'd never want to wear. They'd be way too heavy. And mm -hmm. so I think the fact that what you said is that illusion of the correct costume, that's what costuming is about. Mm -hmm. And that, that people need to realize that, that we are not reproducing museum quality <laughs> garments. <laughs> No. So. And I think it's more fun anyway. I mean, if you want that, go see the movie. Um, yeah. 
And by the same token, you know, I've had students say they have to be dead on stage and they're all like, people are going to see me breathing. I'm like, um, yeah, because that's because you're alive. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like, if they're looking at that, if they're looking at you and go, oh, she's breathing, well, then we're not doing our job because they should be so into the story. And I think it's the same with the costuming. It's that the, the audience knows it's a piece of theater and should be walked in, willing to suspend disbelief, or to just go, oh, this is what Greek clothes look like here. Right. Mm -hmm. As and long as I've, we've pushed into their, their reality just enough, the illusion that they think Greek is, mm -hmm. we're good. <laughs> well, and we've had discussions before where, oh, and I lost you again. Hold on. No, you're there. You're no, good. Oh, you're I'm still here. there? Yeah. There it is. <laughs> Never mind. Whew. Um, my husband and I have a lot of discussions about how no, if you just have the something that, that brings them into that time period, like in the mm -hmm. set. You know, you have a, a desk and two chairs, but the chairs are a little bit more innate, and you have kind of a Tiffany-style lamp. You know, they'll fill, you might not have walls, but they'll fill it in. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. And if you kind yeah. of bring into that something with the right silhouette and, like, a few touches of something that they'll fill in the rest of the picture of knowing that this woman is a bit higher class than this woman, or whatever it is. And that's yeah. what makes like it that. fun. I firmly believe audiences like that little bit of work. Mm -hmm. They like going, oh, look, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that, that's Victorian. I but what they that. don't like is when they're jarred out of it by those kids. Yeah. True. <laughs> True. They don't like that. <laughs> no, they don't like that. That dude's wearing Converse high top. <laughs> right, that doesn't work, unless it's a choice. Unless it's a choice. <laughs> And I do oh, like that, cool. too. I kind of like, um, I think, Carolyn, one of the things you said to me and I fell instantly in love was the idea of Greek steampunk or something. I think you oh, said to me, I'm like, I yeah. love that. I love that sort of um, fusion idea. Yeah, definitely. So the silhouettes you guys were talking about, do you mm -hmm. find that, like, sometimes a certain modern era silhouette can, lurk, can work for... <laughs> another period like is there something that's like 40s <laughs> or I like think that the the certainly the um, the you know, I gotta get my centuries right here the 20th century from about 30 on you can usually find dresses out there that again with details you and you get the right length you can kind of fake it for dresses and as far as men go all you need to do is when you're doing your research, you want to look at um, the length of the men's coat and how many buttons. And you can fake a three-button coat so easily by just folding the lapel over a little bit more and putting a snap and another snap and then a button on top of it so it lines mm -hmm. up. And it looks like you've got a three-button coat, but it's a two-button coat with a fake. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I really think the 20th century is pretty easy to fake again most of the uh, I, I normally fake the 30s through the late 50s all with the, the time. same dress yes, <laughs> same dress. yes he does use the same dress <laughs> over and over again and I'm like that's the wrong period and he's like yeah but you're the only one that knows it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably true yeah it probably is it's probably like, true. yeah it probably is <laughs> so Oh, well, it wow. seems like the um, um, it seems like the '50s silhouette, and I want to say like the '80s silhouette, almost kind of matched. Yeah, they the, kind of mirror a little bit. Um, when you get that, and when um, when we had the the oh, it was probably early 2000s. We had those letters on all of our sweaters and everything. If you remember, with the letters on your purses were really big. With that worked great for '50s. Because we had those tight little sweaters with letters on them. Um, well, oh, to the little Vernon Shirley. Well, yes, but also <laughs> in general to the 50s. Um, yeah, and, and I think that the 90s stayed around for a really long time. <laughs> they did. They did. And, and the, uh, the 60s, that sort of, um, they seems like you can probably find a lot of a sort of renaissance feel yeah. Well, and I think the '60s are. You think you're finding a little more and more of the '60s now again, 
Mm-hmm. So again, if you're doing a show in the '60s, you can pretty much. And I'm sure the '70s will be coming back. Again. Yeah. American Hustle. That's mm-hmm. true. <clears throat> That's true. So, I mean, I like to I use those '80s dresses or that Joan kind of Laura uh, Ashley, Laura Ashley kind of dresses. And then the. All the shoulder stuff from the, the 80s. The boat neck style stuff. The dynasty, Joan Collins. Yeah. Which gives you that 40s feel. Yeah. Yeah, it really <laughs> does. It really does. It seems and, you, you know, if you just bring, come back do again. a little bit of rearranging, or uh, it can easily fake the 40s really well. and Removal of the shoulder Yeah, the Laura Ashley, <laughs> if you just play around with the hem, then you have, like, the 30s. Yeah dress, um, and you know, if you just use crinoline and what, just below the knee, for, what for 50s, yeah. um, then that gives you that silhouette or that type of thing. I always think, you know, with that big full look of like West Side Story, <laughs> those type of iconic things that give us a sense of time period, you know, and you have... And then you get, what, the A-line dress in the 60s, and you have, you know, so many shows are set just right after 62 or right after 62 or 63 because of the Kennedy assassination. Right after both of those? Didn't one of them want to be before? Well, depending, (laughs) you either have shows or right before Camelot ended. Ladies and gentlemen, Mommy and Daddy are fighting right <laughs> because if you look at, I mean, you look at Little Shop of Horrors, it's right before. Mm-hmm. If you look at, um, I'm trying to think of other shows off the top of my head, of course, I'm not coming to me, but if you look at just that time period, so much so much writing deals with that because it was such a cultural shift. Mm-hmm. And so you have those iconic type um, periods. Um, and if you think mid-60s, it's that Jackie, oh, Jackie yeah. Kennedy look. Yeah. Is so iconic, at least in a... Especially right now with the the, um, the, 50th, anniversary, the anniversary having just yeah. happened, I think. It's got its revival going on. And I think in a lot of ways the sort of same issues that were raised around that time maybe... Yeah, well, and I think Obama kind of brought some of that back, too, with bringing the kids to the White House, or the, you know, it seemed like the first time in a long time. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that, that there was a little bit of reference to, to that, too, so I do think you're right. Um, yeah, they really wanted Michelle to be more Jackie O and put yeah. those guns of hers away. <laughs> I know, but boy, doesn't she wear pretty clothes? <laughs> oh, my God, she's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. and her one coffee. thing I, I want to caution, since we're talking about silhouettes, is caution um, people about buying true period clothes and expecting them to fit today's <laughs> people. Um, sizing is completely different. When we see Marilyn Monroe was a size 14, well, yeah, she was a size 14, but a size 14 wasn't the same size 14 it was we like are. like a size 8, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was much smaller. Yeah. And so, um, same thing with, I have two or three Rubbermaid boxes full of period patterns that are beautiful for research, but they'd all have to be resized if I wanted a real person to wear them. So, if you're making clothes, you've got to still watch, um, oh, you know, I have this great pattern in my attic. Well, it's probably not going to work. But all of the pattern companies make great retro patterns or the historical costume patterns, which are really good if you have to make that one special garment. Um, those, that's, uh, those are real good. There's also books out there that are great about helping with pattern patterning um, that I think are really, I think are, are really user-friendly. One of them I'm going to hold up right now. Ta-da! Nick will put this up on the... The, the thing it's Show the, notes. yeah it's patterns for the theatrical costumes and they give you different ways on how to resize patterns for them mm. um, it's certainly a down and dirty way to deal with it so yes that's <laughs> terrific that's terrific um, uh, Nick did you want to start talking about the some of the tech tools that these ladies gave us and Hopefully, yeah. Carolyn will make it back in. It's Friday the 13th, and Carolyn is in some sort of <laughs> Wi-Fi heart right now. 
<laughs> yeah, I think there's a lot of just information out there that people can. Um, I've got a lot. I can... Then I'm going to pull this one up and share it. And... Do you want me to talk about it? Yes, why don't you talk okay. about it while I share it. Okay. This is the Customer's Manifesto. Um, Tara McGinnis uh, is the person who created this. Um, I believe it is probably run by a lot more people than just her um, because she does have a, another job um, <laughs> besides running this website. But the Customer's Manifesto, you can click on any of these things that Nick is pulling up. Um, and do you have it up, honey? Okay. Um, in just a moment, he is going to click on costume history <laughs> in just a minute there. Okay, click on his, uh, where is it? No, thank you. Now it's big enough. Click on, <laughs> I couldn't see it. Stop laughing at me. Um, where is, I was looking at it earlier. Where is it? History. Fashion history. Right in the center. There we go, yes. And this one, you get all of these links by period. Um, pick a period and click on it. Okay, there you go. And then we've got general costume. Here's women's dresses. Now, some of this stuff is going to take you to books. Some of it is going to take you to different websites. Some of it is going to take you to, um, to uh, right re research. Dead links. <laughs> dead links. Uh, yeah, there are going to be some dead links. Um, the sum of it is going to take you to paintings. Uh, there you go. There's uh, obviously some reenacting. Um, so you're going to get all kinds of different things. There's also a patterning link. There's a link to vendors, where to go to buy things. So it's just really a good source for pretty much everything. I, I don't think I've ever met a costumer who hasn't mentioned the Costumer's Manifesto as a sort of <laughs> holy grail. <laughs> yeah, it, it is a great site. Um, no, no, put your hand down. So, Tino has joined us. <laughs> Hi, Tino. Well, right. what, what young child doesn't love to talk about theatrical costumes? That's right. He has an opinion <laughs> about everything. You should hear him. Anyways, now we are on Fashion Era, and this is a website that I'm pretty positive used to have a different name. I think it used to be called Costume History. I'm pretty positive. I think you're right. It looks familiar. Yeah, because I was looking for costume history, and this is what I found. Um, and again, we get a bunch of history of type clicks. Um, you get uh, a lot of pictures and research. Um, again, it just kind of click on any one of those, Nick. You get car commercials. Um, <laughs> yeah. Everything you get called commercials or something. Okay, thank you, sweetie. <laughs> <laughs> All those sad things. So, oh, but it takes you, know. you to information. It takes you, you to, um, like I said, <laughs> pictures. All of these websites can suck you in for days <laughs> and uh, never let you out. But you can kind of, for, you know, you can see things like the silhouette. Um, Sometimes they, get, again, give you different uh, books as resources. And then the last one that I put in there was, oh, Tuxedo Wholesaler, which, again, can be a little pricey, but if you've got a longish run and you need mail clothes and you need period mail clothes, these aren't bad. Um, you, you get a variety of different jackets. Uh, there is a price for purchasing and a price for renting. Uh, and just click on one and you'll see. Most of them are made out of old tuxedos. And they've taken an old tuxedo and they've redone it to become a period-esque garment. So mm -hmm. that's just a website that I know when I was working at the university I did use. Um, for men's clothes occasionally because, you know, when I needed that really specific odd man's outfit that I didn't want to make, we would rent. 
So. And I'm pulling up a site that Carolyn talked about, um, the Tudor Taylor. Um, and I think, Carolyn, that's also a book. It's a book, and it, it is a bit more technical, like, mm -hmm. for the true reenactor kind of thing. Um, so it's just a neat one to have um, around. But I have, I have a bunch of different books in, in the house of just, like, basically for the theater teacher to kind of, the, the, like I said, the silhouettes, very cheap, easy stuff. I have them around here somewhere. Hold on. And I would think that, um, and it looks like this is even from the U.K., uh, the site part okay. of it, but I would guess that it would still be valuable to research, like mm -hmm. you said, to be able to look at the silhouette. Definitely. A, a costume idiot like me can look at this and start to get some ideas, like, oh, yeah, well, like Carolyn said, I could pull some sleeves off. I could um, I could add just a tiny little collar and make it really look good. Um, and they've got everything here. I'm just looking. They've got jewelry. Yeah. Children's patterns. That's awesome. Yeah, this is a, gorgeous um, site. a book that I have. It's a stage costume step by step by Mary T. Kidd with two D's, K I D D. The nice thing about this one is it has different sections on a shape and how you know what all you can do with a semicircle. So they have it for like cloaks and skirts and how a semicircle can be reworked to all sorts of different basic shapes and how you can adapt them. You know, the teaching is good for a kimono and good for Greek and good for everything. So, and how to make the basic stuff because there it says, you know, adapting the basic shape for your African for kimono everything. So this is a good one, for teachers and such. So what was the who's the author on that one? Mary T. Kidd, K. I. D. D. Thank you. Yeah. We'll put that up in the show notes too. And it has it by Pierre. Uh, we're, we're losing her. Like we're losing know. her just a little bit. Um, Sorry. That's okay. It's Friday the 13th. And you also <laughs> talked about an, another one called Elizabethan costuming, 1550 to 1580. 50, um, and I am not promoting Amazon here, but I, it's the first place I got that showed it, but I'll show them what that looks like. That's another one of those books I feel like every costumer I've there ever you. met has like there you are. waved some weather-beaten <laughs> um, copy of that. Look at how loved it is. It's, and, and <laughs> there's pieces coming apart, and I love it. And uh, Carolyn, you said you also use Pinterest when you're doing your research. Can you talk a little bit about what your process is and how you do that? Sure. Um, a lot of times, you know, there's some very creative people out there, and it might not be the whole look because it's so detailed. But I'll look up, you know, a uh, especially with some of the newer things like the steampunk and that sort of stuff. But there are so many beautiful pictures of Victorian and different costumes and such. So I'll just type it in like basically you would Google and you know Elizabethan men's shirts or whatever and just to see kind of the different looks. It's really more of an inspiration page than than anything to go to but many of them have you, know, you click on the link and it'll take you to the next web page where they found that picture and a lot of times there's maybe a diary of how they made it and that sort of stuff. So that's, it's really, there's so many just gorgeous things on there. And what I find interesting, and this is one of the things I did with uh, Danielle's show, the Helen of Sparta, is uh, I had looked up, you know, she said basically she wanted, like, runway Greek, stuff that was a bit more. <laughs> so I, I looked through a lot of um, runway stuff, you know, like just looking for different, designers and things that were inspired by Greek stuff and took some of that for the inspiration and instead of having to do all the searching on Google myself Pinterest has it now people have done it already because it's so easy to just see something and pin it and put a tag on it and have it all in one place which is one of the neat things there so you can go back and look at I don't know Galliano's whatever spring line because somebody pinned it somewhere and, and there's <laughs> 
those kind of different aspects from different uh, time periods and such in those too. I love that suggestion because yeah. I think a lot of people are already on Pinterest and maybe mm -hmm. haven't thought of using it in that way. I think that's yeah. awesome. And I, talking about that reminds me of what I use in my film class. It's called uh, Fashion and Film. It was a stars documentary that talks about the costuming process in film and also gets into that whole cycle how film inspires fashion and fashion inspires film and mm. the back and forth because we have, you know, the um, how Johnny Depp and uh, <laughs> Pirates of Caribbean pushed all the pirate stuff and then like the atonement, the green dress and how that mm. inspired the um, prom season uh, mm -hmm. and the bias cut during right after that time and it's just interesting how they cycle upon each other, the dress in Titanic and, you know, the mid 90 you know, late 90s and that type of look and like I said, I can only imagine what American Hustle will bring us during <laughs> the spring. <laughs> the 70s will be back because I'm sure yeah. that, show, that movie will make money and then I'm sure there's already people already copying the dresses from the pictures they put out there. Yeah. Or I'm sorry, looks that are inspired by a movie <laughs> is I think the quote <laughs> they have used. Yeah. <laughs> Luckily I don't go to prom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <That's cool. laughs> there are a couple of good sites out there too where you can look up the movie pick you know costumes and so on and they'll give you a by era and I unfortunately didn't get it for you ahead of time but if I find it I'll send it to Danielle or post right. it on the Google Plus That's thing great. too. And and it has all the different eras and you can click it because they've already done all the work. You know, they have people who do this all day long doing the history and everything and you can kind of steal from that. It's so true. I mean, that's such a valuable way of thinking to remember that um, if you're asking the question, you're probably not the first one to have asked it, and somebody else probably has posted information mm -hmm. about it. Except, by the way, about whether there are more Shakespearean deaths <laughs> on stage or off stage. I scoured and couldn't find it. So if I can take this moment, Nick, to plug that, sure. um, and we'll put a link to it in the show notes as well, but um, we have started a spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> so Kevin Brookhauser, if you're listening, and we're crowdsourcing it, we started counting every play, how many die on stage and how many die off stage, and it's in its baby stages so far, but <laughs> I will find this answer. I yeah, only 37, <laughs> only what, 36 more to go. <laughs> well, Jeez. not every play has deaths. For instance, you're not going to find deaths in most of the comedies, although some of them do. Winter's Tale. I think uh, Midsummer doesn't that start out with, isn't there a death of somebody? Well, we're counting, okay. <laughs> <laughs> like it introduces the... It's got to be a character who is oh, well, that's not in the play. You can't just say there's <laughs> dead people. Like we're, okay. we're not going to count Hamlet's like father. Dead, a dead person, I think. <laughs> deaths on stage. Otherwise, we'll okay. have armies and stuff like that. No, That's true. Death on stage, and you have to actually die on stage. Not like Mercutio, where you're like, I'm stabbed. I'm going to run away and die off stage. So okay. then I'll have to drag my body away. Okay, and and we don't. There's count. rules to this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> The Winter's Tale, though, has is a was sort of a con. I guess it's more of the one of the problem plays. But yeah, uh, I think it is has one of the best ones. It's just exit stage left pursued by bear. So <laughs> that guy's gonna get mauled by a bear. So you don't have to count the armies because they obviously no. die off stage. Exactly, and they don't. Okay. Yeah, not. And they don't have names, and they don't really ever appear on stage. Right. If they have don't to appear, appear on stage at one don't. time. Okay. Right. right. Okay. Now, now, Duncan's uh, nameless servants who get killed, they do, I think, appear on stage briefly um, <laughs> and are killed, but sorry, spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, yeah. it's been a little bit obsessive for me to be 
I knew it would be. I promised you guys <laughs> when we had the show that I would be a little OCD about that question. Sorry, That's this is nothing funny. to do with costuming. This is something I should talk to my therapist about. <laughs> <laughs> right. well, you I guys gonna, are my therapist right now. That's it. I, I was going to add a real quick what every, I think every young theater should have, um, things that they should have in stock. When you're at, when you're at Goodwills or thrift stores, if you find suspenders, you should just buy them, especially if they're button tight. That, mm -hmm. That's one thing. I think all the hats you can possibly get donated are great. Um, gloves of any type, whether they're short gloves or long gloves, are definitely something that should be kept in stock. Glasses of all types, although they really should be able to be seen through. And, um, and then jewelry. And so if you have patrons who say, what can we donate? I'm cleaning out grandma's fill-in-the-blank. <laughs> Those are the things that definitely should live in most theaters. Carolyn, you <laughs> just a second. Do you have anything to add, Carolyn? You know, the thing I, I do is look in that odd place. Um, one of Some of my favorite skirts that I've ever made were tablecloths. Okay. And yeah. just big, because you get those ones for like a five-foot uh, five round that mm -hmm. then hit the floor. You take that, you know, measure from your your stomach down to the floor and move that forward, and then you complete the whole back. And it can be Renaissance, it can be Victorian, and you've got this nice full-length skirt, or it's a full circle skirt as long as you pleat it right. Right. So things like, I, I happened upon a uh, yard sale for a, um, uh, what's it called, a, a entertainment, you know, like a, a rental company for tables and chairs sure, and yes, such. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those kind of things. And I bought so many tablecloths that are nice, and they're already finished on the end. Mm -hmm. um, for, I think, 20 bucks, I got 10 of them. So that's an option, too, you know, going to some of those companies. That are you retiring some of these tablecloths? Mm -hmm. You know, what will they donate because they just can't use them anymore, and then you've got a nice full circle skirt out of nowhere for nothing. I love that idea. That's a great one. It's one of my favorites. I love that skirt so much. Plus, it washes so nicely because it's already yes, been <laughs> I do. <laughs> and it's so, stain retardant. <laughs> double do it. Um, but those kind of things are looking at the the place you might not have looked at and, and what can I make from this mm -hmm. um, has always been something. And just, you know, just keep looking. I have found some of my best stuff that was perfect just because you just kept going through the it racks and, and happened upon it that day. Thank you, Daddy. So, <laughs> Thank you, Daddy. Discount day at the thrift store is an always a good thing to take a few minutes and run through. I never would have thought of that. You're so inventive. I stand in awe. <laughs> yeah, I think looking for those um, materials that maybe might not be <clears throat> that are non-traditional like draperies, and I think Carolyn's got a lot of great ideas with that. Is fabric is fabric. Scarlett <laughs> O'Hara knew what she was and, and you have to put it together, and then you're... Mm -hmm. It's how you put that fabric together, whether it started off as uh, draperies or upholstery or, you know, it was supposed to be a chair or... Um, so... It just offers a lot of things. You just have to think outside of the box sometimes and just think bigger picture. Yeah. Or mm -hmm. I would also say um, making, you know, so there's some of those, there's Joann's and obviously some of those big stores of the Joann's and Calico Corners and that sort of stuff. But if you can find a couple of those places in your town that are independent fabric stores or places that mostly do like upholstery and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I have made very good friends with a place in town that's a local place and I'll pop in and buy some stuff and they'll just send me out with the remnants because it's not a and say here just take it home because I know you'll do something with it and they might not be big enough to reupholster a couch but they're plenty big to make a doublet or a, a shirt or you know a vest or mm -hmm. something out of. Yeah. So I've got tons of that. Especially when you get into that Shakespearean time mm -hmm. frame, or any of you know that time frame, it gives you that richness, and you may have got it for free or at discounted or. Um, Tell them we'll put them in the program. 
Yeah, <laughs> that too, and it doesn't hurt to give away a couple, away, a couple of free tickets. I even talked some of those people into sewing for me. <laughs> wow, that's you've got the. <laughs> I, I talked the an entire going. store into sewing Winnie the Pooh when we did Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> one was Kanga, one took Piglet, one took uh, <laughs> Winnie the Pooh. Yeah. Man, you've got the charm whammy. Yeah, my wife's the delegate, queen of delegation. <laughs> <laughs> and you love it, sweetheart. <laughs> yeah, except I'm tired of being delegated to <laughs> throw the, the reach of the hug it out. Hug it oh, out, guys. Hug it out. Tino's starting to take orders now, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this was a great show. I have a feeling a lot of... Uh, <laughs> folks will find this useful and and really interesting. You guys are just so inventive. It's amazing. It's not inventive, it's necessity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The show's got to go up. Got to <laughs> solve the problem by the time the curtain goes up. One thing one of my professors told me is that a customer needs to know how to make silk out of a sow's ear, and uh, that's pretty much what we do. <laughs> well, and it had to have happened in Shakespeare's time, too. There, I yeah. makes me think of that... Yeah. Um, the prologue from Henry V where he says, uh, uh, for tis your imagination which now must deck our kings, right? And meaning you're, you audience are going to have to really <laughs> play along and imagine in order for our kings exactly. to look like kings. <laughs> I won't do the whole monologue even though I know it and totally could. <laughs> yeah, I, I've done that before when I've said, you know, I can do the whole monologue. Do you want to hear it? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. You should see the um, <laughs> high school musical wildcat dance. <laughs> oh, I had to live through that one. It's Twice. It was great. <laughs> well, <laughs> we're, almost at, <laughs> we're almost at an hour already. Can you believe it? Oh, wow. <laughs> and poor Carolyn is probably aerobically exhausted from... Uh, losing and reconnecting, yeah. Well, well, my husband apparently was downstairs on the computer, which uh, I blame him. But he has <laughs> nicely gotten off for a little while, so I think I'm okay for a bit. <laughs> like, really? You have the TV, but that's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I would do want to share one quick thing. Um, there are some really great books called... Uh, one's called Retro Makeup Techniques for Applying the Vintage Look by, by Lauren uh, Reynolds and she also has a book called um, Vintage Hairstyling uh, Retro Hairstyles with Step-by-Step -step Techniques which covers you know stuff from I don't know 20s 30s on but uh, great for giving that look and tells you how to do it step by step, and I which is great for students. Some of your students have followed those and done yes. a pretty good job. <laughs> yes, and so I find those two uh, great things to um, to use with your um, while doing your um, shows. So I'll put those in the show notes, but and those are two Richard books Corson's, I added to our curriculum. Richard Corson's stage makeup is... Mm -hmm. yes. Oh, I also like, favorite. what's the blue book I like? I think it's called Stage Makeup Step by Step. But who is it? Oh, she name. taught at University of uh, Southern Illinois Carbondale. I can't think of her name. But that's another one that I think is a little high, more high school friendly. Mm. And it's cheaper. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, because Corson is expensive. <laughs> and, really and the expensive. pictures are a little bit more up to date. Nick can put a link for both those I'm books. I'm sorry. I've used Corson for years and years. I know. I love Corson. <laughs> I love it. Put a link for both of those up. Yes, I will. Okay. See, I delegated. <laughs> <laughs> um, we probably need to wrap up the show. <laughs> um, Carolyn, um, do you have... Um, if people wanted to uh, find out about you, or do you have an email, or a web address, or... Um, really, just Carolyn Spiker, at, or, wait, which one do I want to use? Uh, just Carolyn Spiker, all one word, at yahoo.com is the easiest way to get a hold of me. Great. C-A-R-O-L-Y-N-S-P-E-I-C-H-E-R, at Yahoo. 
we'll put a link in the notes too. Yes, yeah. and if you would like to get a hold of my wife, just email me. <laughs> <laughs> or just contact I me. <laughs> I see. You yeah, gotta try to say the first great screener. I'm not great at you know, no. checking my email. That's what he's trying <laughs> to say. Mm-hmm. It's gonna come back on me anyway, so <laughs> um so if you need to get a hold of me or my wife, it's at Tech for Theater uh, on Twitter or um, at techfortheater.com is my blog. And you, of course, always can get a hold of us at theatercast at edreach.us. So those are uh, ways. If you have costume questions, um, I will definitely pass them on and then have her get back to you. And then, Danielle, how can people get a find out about you on the interwebs? <laughs> you can find me on Le Twitter at Ms. <laughs> Philas, M-S-F-I-L-A-S, or you can seek out my latest pontifications on edunerd.blogspot.com. Uh, and encourage, I want to encourage people to, one, count the deaths in Shakespeare and get a hold of Danielle. <laughs> <Please>. <laughs> um, so if you can take, you, you know, <laughs> pick one of them and say it's mine uh, and let her know um, so that we can get this spreadsheet done because <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. And <laughs> encourage everyone to uh, become part of the worldtheatervideo.com project. Um, and we are tackling bullying and using a script from uh, Lindsay Price from Theater Folk, her play called The Fun House, and uh, you can find that at worldtheatervideo.com, and you have till January 25th to get that done, so please share that with everyone. I'd like to have a really great turnout, um, and I think if we can give a variety of views um, and deal with bullying, because I know that's something that uh, we've all dealt with one way or another throughout our lives. Uh, if we can turn that into a positive and use theater to help people make aware of it, um, I think that's one of theater's strengths. Um, so I encourage you to um, be a part of that. Uh, be sure to share what your edgy wins at whatyouredgywin.com. Uh, and if you have a teacher, student, parent, uh, that has done something that really um, helped education and made you take notice, uh, nominate them for the EduWin Awards. So, uh, and you can find all that information at edreach.us. And so uh, just a reminder, um, the show will probably be broadcast midweek around the 17th, 18th of uh, next week. And then... Uh, we are taking the week of the 22nd uh, during Christmas break off. And then uh, Danielle and I will be back on December 29th with a great guest. And um, <laughs> to seeing you all one last time before <laughs> 2013 ends. And uh, thank you all for joining us. And be sure to catch us on EdReach and listen to other great shows on there too. <laughs>